Maxwell and Melbourne Football Club, you're listening to the Coaches Panel. This is Nat Fife from the Fremantle Footy Club. Trent Cotchin from the Richmond Footy Club. Scott Benderbury from the Collingwood Football Club. You're listening to the Coaches Panel. Patrick Cooch from the Carlton Footy Club. It's Rory Sloan here from the Adelaide Crows. This is Tom Mitchell. You're listening to the Coaches Panel. Hey friends, you got MJ from the Coaches Panel. I hope you're well and welcome back to another strategy roundtable with just three rounds left to go in your fantasy footy season. Ben, it feels crazy. But there's some big conversations we've got to have strategically about some players and some options in and around them to help you through the final few weeks of your fantasy footy season. Joining me on this podcast, as he has right throughout the 2023 season, he is the fantasy footy MVP, the Harry Sheasel of the community, Mini Monk. How are you, my friend? I'm back. I'm back. You haven't yep. had me for the last two weeks. and now Back I've from got you a- skiing in the Alpines, mate. And then getting sick, unfortunately. But yeah, I've got you as a captive audience this week. Oh, just you and I, my friend. It's got, it's got some preseason vibes to it. A bit 50 most relevant where it's just you and I. But that's okay. We'll work our way through plenty of stuff. Our Patreons have all asked one player-centered question, which we will get to this person in a moment. And if you're not asking this question, it's probably because you're out of trades in a limited trades format of Supercoach of Dream 2. I'm alluding to, of course, Nick Dacos. So our Patreons, we will get to your questions in and around that and talk very broadly about Nick. If you want to become a Patreon and a supporter of the Coaches Panel, all the details are in the description link of this podcast. Uh, I want to talk about luxury trading in AFL Fantasy. We're well and truly mini monk into that phase of the year. Then there are some some challenges that can come with that when it works and doesn't work your way. I want to unpack your thoughts about that. I want to quickly look through uh, who are the best, some of the best fixture matchups for us this week and the coming weeks. And then, of course, how do we work our way through the trading cadence that can come through the rolling lockouts this week? So there's a fair bit we want to get through just with you and I, Mini Monk, on this roundtable. But Nick Dacos confirmed out for the home and away season, which means for us as fantasy coaches, he is done. He's been one of the best starting squad and trade in options. If you got him in the forward few weeks of 2023, he's been better than I think anybody could have hoped he would be. But if you have a trade in super coach and dream team, this is why you have a trade because you're going to pull the trigger on it this week. If you built depth in dream team and super coach, this is why you built depth. Well, for AFL fantasy, there's a little more strategy to it around it there. So maybe we should walk through those formats a little bit. Let's stay in the limited trades and then we'll come to AFL Fantasy. If you've got just one trade, it feels Mini Monk best available. But if you've yeah. got two, what do you do with that? Because it does open up some options. Yeah, two starts to get a bit tricky because uh, you can get very creative because unfortunately, Dacos got tagged by Finn McGuinness mm. and therefore has had a poor game, dropped a fair bit in cash. And so mm. that kind of limits your options if you've only got the one trade. But if you've got the two trades available, then you can afford to be a bit more creative with where you're going. You can generate a little bit of cash with that first trade and be able to get up to someone, you know, basically take your pick probably in your second yeah. trade. Uh, but it can also allow you to fix another red dot and be able to get someone as a green dot in the process. So if you can trade one of your red dot rookies, be it someone like a, I'm just an example, someone like a Roberts, for example, that you might still have on your bench, make 50K that way, get them to someone who's 102 or 120 or 180K that's playing, depending on the format that you're playing. That's probably a two bird, one stone kind of thing because you're getting the cover should you have another injury and you're getting to best available because we've only got three games left. Yep. And yeah, as you start to get towards the end of the season, those trades become less and less valuable. So why not use it to get to the top of the line? Why not use it to target someone like, I don't know, James Sisley, who has two very, very good fixtures and one average fixture on the way home. Mm. He's probably at the top of the tree if you're looking for a defender replacement. Why not use it to get someone like a Rory Laird who you might have traded out of earlier on in the season or maybe when they got suspended? Or someone like a Newman who's come into a lot of form as Doherty's moved into the midfield. I think that using those two trades in order to facilitate the best possible upgrade that you can in your limited trade formats is definitely a viable option especially if you're able to get a rookie downgrade that's playing and that can provide you cover in other lines as well. So someone who's got, be it, you know, mid forward or defender mid flexibility, because that cover can be absolutely useful. Yeah, there's probably two 
defenders or two matchups for defenders that really scream on paper they look great. Now, we know just because the matchups are favorable, it doesn't automatically mean fantasy scoring. You could probably say Jaden Short to that last week had a, a really favorable matchup and a score in the 90s is, it's not bad. But I think mm. people that jumped in were probably hoping for a, a 120, 130 from him. Uh, the two teams I'm alluding to are Hawthorne and Geelong, probably have the two most favorable matchups and specifically three players. Sicily, Stewart, who are a little bit of the price point around Dacos, a little bit more or less, depending on the format you play. Hmm. And then if you want to pocket a bit of cash, Mitch Duncan, yeah, it's a bit more risky, but from yeah. a fixture matchup, has just as good an opportunity to score well. How important to you as looking at this fixture matchup for the one, two, three week hit you're looking for? Or are you just going, you know what, I'm getting the best of Aldo. I'm not too fussed about the fixture now. It's, it's a bit of both. You yep. do want to go for players that are going to be close enough to that, you know, top six, top 10, because they are the proven scorers. They're the players that can actually pump out those 130s. You know, a positive fixture can bring a, a 70 score to a 95 score, but a 95 score might still not be in the top six. Yeah. But if you've got someone who can go at 95 already and they've got the favorable run, that's when it's absolute gold. So, yeah, those three names that you've mentioned, Sicily, Stewart, Duncan, They've all been in and around the top six defenders. Maybe not this year for Duncan, but in the past and historically, historically. he has been an absolute pig down back. Mm. And when you see a, a three-week block of Collingwood, St. Kilda, and the Western Bulldogs, with those last two being the best matchups in the game, for the people defense. playing off halfback, people yeah. who can get involved in the ch- plus six, and you also realize that Geelong probably need to win all three of their games on the run home to give them the best chance going into finals. Yeah. It screams, pick me. Yeah. So those are the three players that I would be going to. And it's take your preference. If you want to take the bigger risk, that's when you go for someone like Duncan because he does have the body concerns compared to mm. the other two. Stewart's probably the safest of the three. Mm. But Sicily's probably the one that's got the absolute monster ceiling. He is the guy the weekend. that when you're coming up against Sicily in a head-to-head matchup, either in a rankings battle Uh, in the percentage or if you're league focused he's the guy you're so nervous about and to your point the western bulldogs are the best matchup for defenders and for kick-in defenders which sicily takes more than a lion's share of for the hawks and so my goodness if there was ever a week he could go 200 it's this however This is no shade to the fantasy community. I made this point to our Patreons and Spotify subscribers in the Round Review podcast this week. If the fantasy community as a whole see something, and it's no shade on the fantasy community, we are not opposition analysis paid for by the club to pick up trends and things. So if we, the commoner, can see it, chances are the Western Bulldogs this week who have the matchup are going, well... We know they can beat good teams. If we negate one specific player, it's a pretty good chance. So so there is a genuine consideration to go, you know what? I'm going to back in. I know this sentence doesn't make sense for fantasy coaches. I'm going to back in Luke Beveridge and trust (laughs) he will do the right thing. Uh, It feels wrong to say, but if ever there was a week that we're going to pull the negating forward on Sicily, it does feel this is the week. It does. Um, but coaches can be very stubborn. Yeah. And I think that we've seen that with someone like Luke Beveridge, especially. He, he's a very stubborn coach with the way that he controls his team and the way that he plays. He rotates, he throws the magnets. We've all known about players getting bevoed. And one of the things that we've come to learn with him is that he doesn't really tag yeah. ever, no matter what team he's coming up against, no matter how the players have been looking, and no matter if there's one absolute stud in a team, he hasn't been tagging. I I think the tag concern probably rolls in more in the Melbourne game the week after. It's fair. And I I would be pretty surprised if Freo had someone that they could send to him to tag. I think they would probably send someone into the midfield and and use Hayden Young like they have the last couple of weeks to not necessarily tag, but to to hold accountable uh, one of their midfielders, be it a a Newcomb or a Day or a Nash type of player. So, yeah, yeah, the the tag is, you know, a flag, but I I, I just don't see it this week especially. And maybe that's me being naive and wanting him to be a good player to bring in or a good player to own this week. But I I think that he's still a good buy. 
Yeah, there's a bunch of other options. I think that's the beauty of Dacos is within fifty to one hundred thousand dollars, depending on the format you're in, you can pretty much go and get anyone. Dawson has been awesome for us this year. Doherty is another who, since he's come back from injury, has been exactly what people that started with him had expected him to be. Mm. Sinclair's had some patchy moments, but has shown he's got a ceiling. Uh, Wanganeen Miller is is honestly been so incredible for a second year player and is getting zero recognition for becoming a premium defender in his second season. It's incredible. You've got a Luke Ryan. I know the fixture's probably not there for him, but this year, as much as I've hated it, and you probably more so as the Frio fan, seeing him monopolize the footy, he still is that general. And then there's this interesting guy, and I do know you want to touch on some of those guys in a second. And then there's this interesting two for one you could probably say, go all the way down to Jay-Z, mm. pocket yourself hundreds of thousands of dollars, open up a DPP link through that forward and back line that you might not have. And my word, if he plays like he did last week for the next three weeks, he on his own is capable of matching it with any defender you bring in, let alone what that cash avails to you so talk to me about zebel as a prospect the coaches that should be considering him and then if you want you can come back to some of those other defenders i mentioned let's start with zebel he was very good on the weekend mm -hmm. he wasn't just seagulling he played a very good game as well yeah i agree he was controlling their back line and he was the reason why uh north melbourne looked really good in that first half and really held it up to to melbourne down at Blunston. But there are a couple of concerns with him for me. Mm. And that is, you know, he's an old player. He has been known to be a sub risk, be it a green vest or a red vest. Sure. And I just have this inkling of feeling that they might throw him forward at some stage. And, you know, he's played forward a fair bit. Give him a goal as a send off, especially in that last game, which is, yeah. I think, their most favorable matchup as well. When I look at the fixtures, yeah. they're playing Gold Coast down at Blunston. Yeah. That'll be pretty nice for him so th there are some flags but the risk is offset with him because of that price tag and because sure. it allows you to do three hundred thousand dollars worth of upgrading on the back end and and i've been someone who's embraced the 23rd premium train in afl fantasy yes and i think that this might be a way to do it as well because if you look at when north melbourne are playing at least for the next two weeks they're playing the first game on saturday yeah if you can use zebel to facilitate a 23rd premium, get someone that you like. And I know we'll come back to him, but someone like Luke Jackson. Yes. Who also has a good ceiling and also has a good run. And you can loop Jack Siebel onto your field in those two games. If he pops a good score, that's when I'd be all for it. Because as, as we saw on the weekend, he has 130 potential in that role. He has a monopoly nearly on the kick-ins. Yeah. And if he has a bad game, then you can loop him out. So that's a really good option. L if I go back to the other options that you've yeah, please. Through, you know, Dawson, Sisley, Doherty, all absolutely amazing Beasts. options to bring in. Very highly owned at the top ranks, but if you don't own any of them... like It's a defensive move. Absolutely, it is. And you can make the same argument about someone like Jack Sinclair, and even to a sure. extent, Tom Stewart, we talked about his run. His next three games are great. If you don't own him, use it as an opportunity to kind of, uh, get onto him. If we run down the list, I know you mentioned Luke Ryan and how hmm. the fixtures aren't there. I also think the role has changed. If you've hmm. looked at how he's had to play... The last couple of weeks, he's had to be a bit more accountable on his man. So in his last four games, he's only got 90, 98, 112, 76, which, you know, still pretty good scores, yeah. but they're a lot further down compared what, to what they used to be. And they're allowing Hayden Young to rotate into the midfield. And Wagner is actually the one that's been doing a lot of distributing off the halfback flank for them alongside Jordan Clark. So I probably wouldn't be going for Luke Ryan. No, I agree. Wanganin Miller, I think is a very interesting point of difference. He is very capped out on his price. Yeah, I probably wouldn't feel too comfortable going there, but I could see an argument for them. Houston, I don't think I'd be touching any poor players unless you already own them at the moment. They're pretty depleted and their run isn't great. No. And then we start to get into some very interesting territory, the likes of Newman, Whitfield, Jaden Short, even Will Day, Luke, Liam Duggan, Mitch mm. Duncan. And if you're playing for matchups, at the moment, you know, we talked about the best matchups for the teams, but if you talk about the best matchups against teams you're playing, it's games against St. Kilda 
and it's a games against Western Bulldogs. Now, for defenders, yeah. Yeah, for defenders specifically. Now, if we look at Jaden Short, he has St. Kilda this week. Yeah. Great matchup, bottom down in price. We know he has a monster ceiling on him, and he looks like he's playing off that halfback flank now, more so than he did at the start of the year. Correct. No hesitation for me to jump on. Do just note that the Port Adelaide fixture in round 24 is a little bit scary. Yep. But if we look at who else has got relatively friendly fixtures, Liam Duggan has got the Bulldogs in round 23. Yes, he has the Adelaide Crows in round 24, but he's also been playing through the midfield a bit more, not just in that halfback flank, which is quite good for someone like him. It allows him to have a lot of access to ball. Yeah. Will Day, we were talking about players playing off halfback, but he also plays into the midfield at times as well. He He's a really good shot. Even if you've traded out of him at some stage, yeah. don't be afraid to trade back into him. And yeah, I, I think that there's enough different kind of options through there for you to be able to trade into, depending on what the price point is that you're wanting to trade into. But pick a player based on the combination of trades that you're doing, not just the one. Yeah. Because that's the really important part here. You're looking at, Right, I need to get rid of Dacos, but who else in my team do I want to get rid of and who do I want to target and use that to guide where you're going to with that trade? I think an important element we haven't unpacked yet and before we move on to some other elements is mm. people with an opportunity to utilise the DPP within their sites, whether it be because of a Will Day or a Jordan Dawson they've got playing through the midfield, a Sheasel or a Himmelberg down forward, a, a Butters, a Rosie, and any of the other top-line premium forwards that we have, all of a sudden now, through DPP, whether it's on-field or off-field, it doesn't just have to be Dacos equals defenders. It now can open up a couple of interesting prospects. I want to get to Luke Jackson in a moment. We'll get to him because he's definitely someone I want to have some thoughts with you, both for not just AFL fantasy coaches, but dream teamers and super coaches. We know he's got some some avenues to score there too. Hmm. If you can get into a premium midfielder, I, I, hmm. I think the forward lines feel really locked away. While I know F6 has a lot of F6 to F10 could be any of the five players, uh, if you could trade into a midfielder of your choosing hmm. price doesn't matter for the most part we know the million dollars in af of bont and stuff like and merit could be hard to get into it's similar at that high way heavy price tag of 600 plus thousands in super coach and of course the million dollar price point to injury team let's not go up to those big guys i don't think a lot of people have that but of course if you can probably fair enough to go there if you can, within a budget, get to someone within 50K either way of of Dacos into the midfield, who are some guys you'd be encouraging us to consider as prospects? So when we look at midfield matchups, you know, you talked about before with the defender matchups being Geelong and Hawthorne as the two teams to target. If we look at midfield matchups for the next three weeks, mm. it's Adelaide, it's Essendon, and it's the Western Bulldogs that have the best run. Yeah. So you talked about Bontepelli, he's a million odd dollars. If you can't get to him, you can't get to him. Take a haircut. Go someone like Trelaw, someone Liber. like Liberatore, even yeah. someone like McRae if you want to take a bit of a punt. Yep. Adelaide, Roy Led. Yep. If you need the cash, Matt Crouch. Yeah. He's been playing really well, 105, 120 last couple of games. Yeah. He's got the matchups, he's got the CBA role. Go for it. Yeah. And then Essendon, it's just the pair. It's Merritt and it's Parrish. Yeah. So I think that's a you know, half a dozen prospects that you can go for in your midfield. And I'd be um, remiss to mention uh, the other defender that people should be considering in, in my boy in Hayden Young. Yes. Because he is defender in his status, but he's playing in the midfield and they have West Coast this week. Yeah, and the week wow. after, they're playing against Port Adelaide, who are fairly depleted, and he might be standing next to another player. And then the week after, they've got Hawthorne. So that's another player that you can consider if you're looking for a bit of a cheaper option down back. Yeah, it's interesting. You talk about depleted teams. The Fremantle Ruck division got depleted a couple of weeks ago with Sean Darcy going out for the year. Luke Jackson, we now have probably four or five games of data over a two-year sample size. So not a lot, but enough to give us some confidence that when he's the solo Ruck, he can score a really solid premium level Ruck. I don't know if he's got... Max Gorn ceiling on his day, but gosh, we saw just last week against Brisbane against Darcy Fort, who's a relief ruck at best, let's be honest. But coming up against West Coast this week, 
Port Adelaide in the final two weeks as well. Really nice matchups and does offer some value. Talk to me about coaches that have some DPP, have some depth, have some maneuvers around. Is Luke Jackson a popular... He is a popular trade. I won't say is he a yeah, popular. Yeah, yeah. Is that the pack of groupthink observing trends correctly? Or is it just getting a little bit swayed by one week against a relief ruckman? I think it's very easy to get swept up in one week, in one week's worth of data. But I also think that it's real because yeah. you talk about how the the fact is he rucked against Darcy Ford, but last year when he had the solo rock duties, he also played against Brisbane, but he wasn't playing against Darcy Ford that day. He was playing against Oscar McInerney, and I think he went 129 in AFL fantasy. Yeah, and very and, similar in Supercoach too. Yeah, absolutely. And if you look at how he builds his score. He gets involved in everything. Yeah. Kicks, handballs, marks, tackles, gets goals and gets hit out. And I think that's the biggest thing that he's had in these last three weeks is that his hit out numbers have gone through the roof because he's attending rock contests. Yeah. And okay, Bailey Williams has got off his suspension. So that's who he's going to be rocking against this week against West Coast. Sure. But if you've looked at the matchup, he's still a very, very free ruck to play against in terms of point scoring. Yep. And you're not just buying him for the one week, you're buying him for the two because the week after comes against Port Adelaide and he's going to be rucking against Vizantini, who a strong puff of wind could probably blow over. It, well, of the three best ruck matchups we've got uh, for AFL fantasy data, um, there are similar parallels in Supercoach. Yep. Uh, two of those matchups. So, yep. absolutely. Is Jackson hype? Yep, he's absolutely hype. But for two of the next three weeks, He's got two of the three best matchups you could ask for. And the really, really nice thing is he has a bailoff option for round 24 because people have already penciled in. I want to target Tex Walker round 100%. 24 against the Eagles. You got a forward who's maybe a F6 or maybe a loophole option. You can make you'll make money yep. going Jackson down to Tex Walker at round 24, which can facilitate your second trade. And it's just a nice, easy step off to go into that final week of the fantasy year. Those, those some round 24 matchups, when you look at them, there mm. are some players that I think Tex is the obvious one because mm. of what defenders against, uh, especially key position defenders, and the very much lack thereof of West Coast have, and mm. have just feasted all year. And Tex has done it once. Kerno's done it multiple times. In fact, pretty much every team's key position. Is there any other players that three weeks out you could kind of telegraph for us? Because if you're only getting Tex for the one week, again, this is purely AFL fantasy or very, very luxury trade in Dream Team and Supercoach where you're mm. saving it more likely for the league rather than mm. the ranking focus at that point in time. Is there anybody else that you go, look, in that final week, the narrative gives me some some desire to at least strongly consider someone. Any other names you've got for us? Well, we, we try and look at the teams that give up the most amount of fantasy points. Mm. Uh, and West Coast is definitely one of them. Yep. Another one is North Melbourne. So they're playing Gold Coast in that week. So you're looking mm. at the likes of Noah Anderson and Tuk Miller and maybe a Sam Flanders even as well, if you're wanting to get a bit bit more creative and have a bit more flair. Yep. And Hawthorne is probably the other one who Freo plays. So you're looking at the likes of Brayshaw or Sarong and maybe even a Hayden Young if you want to get be creative there. Yeah. Uh, if you're going for those ones in the down backstage, you're probably looking for defenders that are playing against St. Kilda or the Western Bulldogs. Mm -hmm. And that's who we talked about with Geelong, mm -hmm. someone like Mitch Duncan or Brisbane. Brisbane's a bit trickier one. Uh, the one that you would normally go towards is probably... Kadeen Coleman nowadays, now that Rich really isn't playing, but he's been injured too much and I I, I wouldn't have much confidence going there. So no, someone no, like no. Mitch Duncan could be an interesting one to look at. Yeah, and it's very similar. The midfielders, you've already alluded to a couple through there. Adelaide have got that matchup against West Coast. Yeah, uh, Gold Coast have got that matchup against North Melbourne, which is very, very favourable through there. St Kilda's is level pegging against Brisbane. Brisbane of late have, have started to leak a few points through there. Um, yeah. What you probably don't want is you probably don't want GWS or Richmond midfielders that yeah. week in terms of their matchup. So it's equally the the inverse of it too, isn't it? There's fixtures we want to trade into, and yeah. then there's some fixtures where we're trying to avoid. And it brings me to this idea of, again, very AFL fantasy, although some dream team and some super coaches can do it, is luxury trading, where mm. we're, where we're, whether it be about 
fixtures, whether it be about matchups, whether it be about changes in teams, whether it be about um, putting another hundred thousand dollars or eighty thousand dollars on top of another player, we start to find these ways to make moves, and it can absolutely work. If you traded, for example, Dacos to Sicily last week, and you're worried about the tag, and you saw the matchup, wow, like one hundred and thirty point turnaround, yeah, genius move. Took a set to be able to pull it off, but mm. well done on doing it. Equally, if you traded out of a Callum Mills and put 200000 bucks onto a Jack Steele, who, to be fair, had looked awesome the month mm. before, you just forked out 200 odd k for a 60-point loss. So when the luxury trade doesn't go your way, what do you do with that mini monk? What what's the process in your head outside of wanting to rage on Twitter, which I don't think is healthy for anybody to do? Mm. How do you process that moment well when your luxury trade backfires? Think about how much justification you've probably done during the week when you've mm. been thinking about what the trades are you're going to make. You know, yeah. You look at someone like Callum Mills. You've had three weeks of scores that have been between what fifty five and eighty. Give you're fed up with him. Yeah, you fed up with him and you're done. You're like, well, I don't want to have any more of that. And you look at someone like Jack Steele, who's had three weeks of one tennis type scores, and you go, right, he's the one I want to target from here on. Yeah. It's painful because the way that you do it is the week that it hurts. But this isn't round 24. This isn't the week where everything's over and you've taken that 50 point hit. Yeah. You've still got three more weeks in the season. There's every chance that Steele outscores Callum Mills by. 20 points a week for the rest of the year. Yeah. Easily. So that, that's the first point. And the second point is you just got to trust the process because every trade that you make in a year isn't going to pay off. You're not going to trade perfectly 35 times, 36 times in Dream Team and Supercoach and 50 times in AFL Fantasy. It's not. just unrealistic. Law of averages tells you that. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But if you pull off 30, 32 trades that are correct in AFL Fantasy and maybe 20, 25 trades that are correct in Supercoach and Dream Team, Chances are you've had a pretty good year. Yeah. You make 50, 55, 60% of your trades correctly in a year, you've done very well. So you've just got to back yourself and say, right, I got this one wrong based on what's happened in the outcome. My process was right. If I was in the same position again, I'd make the same move. Let's just back it in next time. And that's just what you've got to be able to tell yourself. You've just got to be able to make that distinction between why you made the move mm. and what the outcome of the move was. Yeah, I think it's that's really healthy. I want to unpack luxury trades a little more with you because Ryan Reynolds here for I guess my 100th mint commercial. No, 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 no. 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 I mean, honestly, when I started this, I thought I only have to do like four of these. I mean, it's unlimited premium wireless for $15 a month. How are there still people paying two or three times that much? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be victim blaming here. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash save whenever you're ready. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See details. With rolling lockout, Dream Teamers and Super Coaches have been quite used to this now over a number mm. of years. Uh, AFL Fantasy Coaches, I, I think we're our third season now in to, to using rolling lockout. Definitely second, maybe third. My brain's not working with a, with a desperate lack of caffeine. Maybe even four. Who knows? It's been a couple of years, friends. All right? You're used to it. But it does get to this interesting point now where midweek, and again, it's very AFL fantasy, if you've played the 23rd premium game that you've been talking about a lot on, on this podcast and, and we've been talking about a lot um, over the past couple of years, not just for Dream Team and Supercoach, but for AFL fantasy, you've certainly banged the jungle drums deep and loud for us this year though. When, if you've got a luxury trade, and your loophole is starting to pop for you. What's that process of thought for coaches? Because I think sometimes we get overcommitted to our idea and then just go all in. Um, talk me about that critical tipping point where your 23rd, your bench option is starting to do what you dreamed and hoped for. What's that cutoff point of stick to the plan versus be nimble and fluid and adapt? You've got to kind of go into the weekend with an idea in mind. Yeah. You can't just be going in and saying, right, I'm looking at this player. And if he goes really well, I'll look to take one player off. I don't know who that is yet, but I'll take them off. That's not going to cut it. 
you need to know what the line is for the player to score and what the player is that you're taking off before you go in. Because as you start to get embroiled in the moment, as you start mm. to see that score tick over, emotion gets the better of you. You, you just, you become a creature of habit and you go, oh, yeah. this is very exciting. He's done a good score. I'm going to jump in mine. I'll take someone else up. And then 30 minutes later, they're on 40 points at quarter time and you're kicking yourself. Yeah, It's the same process as when you set a vice captaincy line. You, you know what the line is that you're going to take. You know the player that you're going to be putting the captaincy on afterwards. If that fails, you've got to treat it the exact same way. If you yeah, say, right, I've got, uh, I don't know, I've got Nick Dacos on the bench last week. And if he goes more than 80, then I will take his score. But if he goes less than that, I will put a Will Day on the field. I know they yeah. played in the same game, but that sort of idea. That's the idea, yeah. That's the way you've got to approach it. And, and being able to do that is... What what's the important part? Because that allows you to be very set in the way that you're doing your structures. It allows you to know who's going to have played by that point as well, because that's Correct. a very important thing when you're looping. You need to know who's playing when and what moves I can make, not just with the players that you're moving on and off as your premiums, but the rookies that you're going to be loopholing through because knowing when they play is just as important because how many times have you had it where you've gone, great, I've now my vice captain, oh, I don't have a red dot to be able to put the C <laughs> on and take their score. Oops. Yeah, it I happens. typed my weekend wrong. Yeah, it's happened to be- great coaches too. Yeah. So that's that's the idea. You've just got to have a plan going into the weekend. Don't try and adjust the plan on the fly because that's when things start to go awry. Do you start paying attention to what your opposition are doing again, whether it be you're pushing for that top 100 in AFL fantasy or whether it be that league matchup you're focused for? Again, this is very AFL fantasy centric, just how the app enables you to see what's happening during the round. Whereas for Supercoach and Dream Team, it's not as easy to be able to find that level of information outside of your head to head matchup. Do you have that same factoring in there for you too when you're being very aggressive against that top 100 pack that you're chasing? I think it can be very aggressive, but in in different ways. So Mm. there's really great statistics that exist now now about what the ownership of players is. And and this goes into the weekend, not during the weekend. But you can see, you know, someone like Nick Dacos was 100% owned going into this weekend. There's there's comments coming from the coach that he's likely to be tagged this weekend. He's the perfect player to try and put the E on. And Mm. if he has a bad score, you can gain maybe 50, 60 points on everyone else around you who isn't in the position to be able to do that. Um, and if it's a league matchup, it's the exact same idea. You say, right, well, I have this player in common with him. I have this player in common with the person that I'm facing, but I have the opportunity to be able to look at that score before I make a decision. Yeah. And he doesn't. This is the player that I want to take on. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, that's really good advice. Before we hit some Patreon questions and wrap up this episode, we've talked a lot about Nick Dacos. I still want to keep that conversation going, but I'd like to have an eye towards 2024. Mm. will have midfielder status and is a chance at holding that defensive eligibility. It it, it depends I, a lot about when he comes back yeah. in the year and, and the role he has. I don't think it's certain either way, but I if I was to put a, a, a Mars bar on one, I'd probably say he's a midfielder next year. Um, oh, really? Yeah. But I, Interesting. Think I think there's enough DPP potential there I, I, it wouldn't shock me if that there but it wouldn't shock me if he's a mid only either um i, I think it's the other way i actually do think he keeps defender mid status and, and and doesn't have mid or does just defender mid no i think he has both i think he has defender yeah. mid status I, I think it depends on and champion data have at times alluded to and other times they haven't is there a waiting towards certain parts of the year some years they've taken it as a pure one-to-one data. Other times Mm. it's been weighted there. So there's a bit of secret herbs and spices there that understandably so, they don't want to give everything away. And that's, we totally understand that. So Mm. regardless of his position, Mm. he's going to be highly desirable next year. Mm. Really, if he holds that defensive eligibility, which is absolutely in line as a potential option. Mm -hmm. Is he just one of the biggest locks of the year for us? Or is what we saw last weekend and potentially through the finals enough to tell us you could fade on Nick Dacos, which is why a lot of people chose to in their starting squad this year? Mm. I got a a rebuttal question for you. Are you locking in Harley Reid next year? Am I? Are you locking in Harley Reid? I'm not locking in anyone next year. 
So why are we locking in Nick Dacos then? I'm asking the question because ah. I'm seeing, ev sorry, everybody feels like I'm exaggerating like my child does. Um, <laughs> is a lot of the consensus is he's been great this year. He was great last year. I'm just going to get him again because he's going to be even better mm. and just lock him up and throw away the key. Just want to get an initial thought and reflection on that because I know you think about the game in a similar way that I do, which is it's a new year, new prices, new positions, new value points everywhere. Start afresh with, with your strategies and plays. But they cost 24. What's your initial leanings? My initial leanings is probably no. Yeah. Probably not a lock and probably not someone that I'm going to have in my starting squad because, yeah, he's been very, very good this year. He's been very, very consistent this year. But we've just seen the recipe to slow him down. Mm. We've seen Finn McGuinness sit on him, sit on him hard and, frankly, give him an absolute hard time. Yeah. Now, him getting injured is a very unfortunate thing because – he would have been a great asset for Collingwood in their last three games of the home away season and, and even into the final season as it starts. But if you have a player that has as much impact in a game as he does for Collingwood in, in their success, yeah, and you've seen a coach of a team that's ranked 15th or 16th on the ladder mm. be able to beat them essentially by shutting down their key cog and forcing him to almost play out of full forward in order to have some impact on the game, you're going to take that to the bank and you're going to consider who do I have in my arsenal? Who do I have in my squad of 44 that can do a job on him? And how can I get that person to train to do that role? Because you have six months between now and when Ran Run next year starts to be able to train a person to be able to fill that role. Yep. I think it's fair. I think it's really fair. I'm also with you. I think it's dangerous in August to tell me who you've locked away for March next year. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, I love that you're thinking about 2024. It means you've probably had a shonky year or you're slightly obsessed like the rest of us. Um, but, but maybe let's just see what happens in trade period. Let's see who goes in the draft. Let's, let's see there's about 50 different variables that are still to come before you even think about locking someone in. I mean, we look at who people were considering as a lock for this year, even as late as a couple of weeks before the game started. Rory Laird was a player that went 125, 130 in the back end incredible. of last year. Incredible consistency, incredible scoring. Basically didn't drop below 110 after the bye. All formats, yeah. And he comes out and starts the year poorly. Goes 50-odd. Yeah. If we look at who we were considering down back, it was Sam Doherty, who had a very similarly strong run at the end of the year. People were comes scared of one. Dawson not having a ceiling. We were we all went on to uh, Josh Dunkley, despite the fact that he'd moved to a new club. We're like, he's gonna map, he's gonna mash, he's gonna be great. Started the year poorly, probably could have been a player that you faded and then jumped onto early on in the season. Scared of Taranto in a Richmond form that doesn't score well and and is leading some formats of the game at the buy round for total points. Exactly. There's yeah. so much that can change between now and round one and even between you know the beginning of march and when round one actually starts it's true and it's very very hard to say a player that's going to come in priced at you know 115 in super coach and 109 in afl fantasy it's hard to justify spending that much money for someone let alone a player in their third season who's going to be coming back of an injury and let alone a player who's as prone to a tag as what we've seen as recently as just on the weekend yep so yeah there is major flags there associated with him. And that's not to say that I'm I'm not saying don't pick him next no, year. No, no, of course not. Because you need to monitor everything that comes out, not just from clubs that are looking to play someone on him, but also from the club himself, how he's playing, how he looks in the preseason. But don't just be saying, oh, well, he got injured. He's 37 is going to count in his, in his price from here on. Hmm. He's going to be slightly discounted because of that for 2024. <laughs> I'm going to pick him now because yeah. it's never that simple. And and honestly, the fixture does inform a lot. If he's got Hawthorne round one, you can you're not going guarantee anywhere near you're, you're not going anywhere near it. Nope. If if he has a North Melbourne team, mm. okay, well, maybe we're a bit more interested. But it, you're right. There, there's plenty of variables and, and there are hundreds and hundreds. Trust me, from almost, what, almost a decade of doing the 50 most relevant, 
I've got a list of about 300 players right now. It will grow to 350 through the draft and trade period. And by the middle of December, it'll have shrunk to about 70 once the prices and positions come and the dust yeah. settles. So uh, there's plenty of things that, that can come for you. That is for sure. Uh, let's hit some Patreon questions, Mini Monk, before we wrap them up. They are all Nick Dacos centric, but our Patreons, you pay for the privilege of getting Mini Monk's wisdom. Uh, Corey Blackledge has given the same two players out. And so all he's looking for is a compare the pair. Which pair mm -hmm. do you like the most? Dacos and Hobbs out. These are the three variables he's optioned given to you. Newman and Trelaw, mm -hmm. Liberatore and Short, mm -hmm. Sicily and Luke Jackson. Who do you like out of that trio? Sicily and Luke Jackson. I do too. I'm... I'm not a huge fan of the Newman one for this week, yeah. beyond this week, because if Chera and Walsh are back, that just, it feels like I've got one week pop with him and then it, it might not be as amazing, as good as he's been five or six weeks before this. Yeah, and but it's not even just been the five or six weeks before this. It's really actually just been the last two weeks. Yeah, that's true. He's been really good the last two weeks. He's got a 139 against St. Kilda and a 123 against Collingwood. In AF and DT, yeah. In AF and DT. But, you know, 93 against West Coast, 108 against Port Adelaide, 108 against Fremantle. It's not something to, to write home about. And if you look at the fixtures for the next few weeks, it's Geelong, Brisbane, and Essen, which, you know, are pretty neutral matchups. I think that the... For Carlton, the, they've got Melbourne... GWS and Gold Coast. Oh, my bad. I've got the wrong fixtures. No, Melbourne, Gold Coast, and GWS. Right. Correct. They're, they're not fixtures that you write home and you say, right, he's going to go 130 on. And yes, Cardinal looked really good. Yes, Doc, he's gone into the midfield. But you've also got to recognize that Newman's price is fairly inflated now. So if you got onto yeah. him five weeks ago or even two weeks ago last Brilliant. week, Right, you'd hold him from now on, but I'm not as interested as him as, as a few of the other options in that defensive line. I think it's a fair shout. AJS for AFL Fantasy. His big overarching question is, do you think Zebra will play and hold this role for the, for the next three weeks? That's the overarching question. And let me tell you the, the, the kind of detail behind the question he's got. He says, I can get, if I go Dacos up to Sicily, Mm. He can get Windhager to Zebel at F6. He's got five big primo forwards that he's happy with, which I think most people are. Mm -hmm. He's really content with his defenders. If he does get someone else other than Sicily, well, now he's looking at the short Newman, Butters, Jackson. It, it mm. opens up a few more options. So I guess Zebel and Sicily is a three-week combination or at least a two-week combination from a Sicily perspective potentially, but let's be mm. honest. If you're trading into Sicily, it's for the three weeks. Yeah, it is. Zebul, it's probably the same. Mm -hmm. What's your take? Does Zebul give you enough getting Sicily? Are you happy to take the risk on Zebul? Or would you rather kind of balance out that cash a bit and go a bit more short Jackson, short Butters sort of combination? Because I've faded Newman out because of what we just said. Yeah, I... I I find this one a really tricky one because I think this is where it starts to get very interesting about the Zebel move. When you're moving someone like Windhager or maybe even like a Hewitt onto him, mm. that's when it starts to be a bit more, well, you can go either way because if Zebel pops and you've got Sicily as well, great. That could be, that could be on your day, 300 points between those two players. Comfortably. Comfortably between them. But if it goes wrong with Zebel, and it could be 100 points between them. It could be 100 points between them. And, and that's the higher risk, higher reward. So if you want to take a risk, I mean, yeah. there's three weeks left in the season, so why the hell not? 100%. I'd go Sicily and Zebel. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I'm all for ceiling at this time of year, um, depending on where you are, AGS, go for it. Uh, Ian McRae, an absolute legend, as are all our Patreons, to be honest with you. Mm. In Dream Team, Dacos mm. for Stewart or Sicily. He's got a super coach dilemma for Dacos too, but who do you like in Dream Team, Stewart or Sicily, it's his last trade, so the cash doesn't help him either way. So it's a pure Sicily versus Stewart three-week play. Who Ooh. do you like more? This is a tricky one. Mm -hmm. uh, I like both a lot, um, and it all depends on what you want to do because I know that depends where you're ranked as well because yeah. Stewart is very highly owned up at the top ranks because of when he was cheap early in the season, and Sicily is not very owned in Dream Team near the top. If you want to take a bit of a punt and you want to take that pot option on, then go Sicily. But I think if you're wanting a bit more consistency, that's when I would go Stuart. But both are very, very valid options. 100% agree. Uh, same question, 
Mm -hmm. But in super coach, Dacos out, Stuart or Sicily? What's I, your leaning Z? Does it change in the format for you? Oh, I need to have a look at Sicily's scores very quickly in Supercoach because I know that Stuart is a very, very good scorer in Supercoach. Yes. I I think I would be going Stuart though. Yep. Just because you don't have that potential of a bad game and a bad game can be a really bad game in Supercoach. Oh, yes, it can. Oh, yes, it can. So Sicily's currently averaging... Um, for the season, uh, 116 going at 146 in the last three. Uh, yeah. Stewart going 129 in the last three off the back of a 114 through the year. So very, very similar. It comes back to, like you said, the next three weeks, the matchups, mm. both on their day can push 200 in Supercoach. Um, yeah. So I look at Sisley and only four weeks ago, he had a 58 against North Melbourne. And then I look at Stewart and he's only had... Yeah, he hasn't had a game below 91 where he wasn't injured. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'd be going Stuart there. It, it feels a safer play and honestly, a ceiling perspective. He's got 140s and 150s within him too. Yes, he so, does. I mean, you know, three weeks ago against the Lions, he, went, he goes 150. I think it's just the safer option there. Yep, fair enough too. Hey, Mini Monk, you've been a superstar across this episode, mate, as you have been for us right throughout the year. Appreciate your fine work helping our listeners navigate uh, the third last week of 2023. Good to be back and not many trades left to go. So I hope you all have a fantastic run to finish the season. Yeah, but that's the hope, isn't it? We hope from you that are chasing rankings glory, that absolutely the element of luck goes your way, but also your plans, the skill, the tactics, the nuances you're looking at, that you make sure that narrative holds strong and holds water and you're not falling asleep at the wheel, metaphorically speaking, uh, of how you're driving your fantasy footy season. We hope for those that are in league battles, we hope the variables, the unique matchups, that some things are kind to you this week. Whatever this week holds, we hope you enjoy yourself. We thank you for being a part of the Coaches Panel in 2023. We can't wait to be back early next week for our Patreons and our Spotify subscribers. I'm back with another round review, but for everybody else, we'll be back for another strategy round table, the second last, focusing on 2023.